the Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents The Kingdom Driven Family Podcast with your host, Andrea Schwartz. This podcast will equip and empower you to help advance Christ's kingdom through God's primary institution, the family. Building a home that serves Christ and His kingdom. Schwartz with the Kingdom Driven Family Podcast. This conversation took place in the spring of 2016 with a young mother whom I mentor who wanted to discuss the subject of time management. The theory that I have is that Jesus, in his 33 years on earth, with only about three of those years spent in active ministry, At the end of the Gospels, John says that if everything were to be recorded about what Jesus did, the whole world wouldn't even be able to contain the books written about it. So in that short amount of time, Jesus maximized it to a great degree and um, unbelievably so. And I know that he's God. And so it seems like it's not fair, but he's also man. And so he had the same temptations that we do. And so I'm exploring the idea that the reason that Jesus was able to maximize his time to the degree that he did is that he applied God's law word to every single decision he made. So I wanted to explore that idea with you when it comes to maximizing your time and time management, effectiveness, all of that. It's really a very good question because once you decide that you're a kingdom seeker in that regard, what I mean is that you want what God wants And instead of having personal considerations come to the top of the priority list, God's considerations, God's mandates for us go to the top of the list. So there is a huge difference between us and Christ in as much as through all of Christ's life, he lived as a human being, fully experiencing humanity in himself, but he did so without sin. And I don't know about you, but I can't picture any day of my life where sin hasn't been part of the equation. Right. And that's, and that's where time wasting comes in. Well, part of it is Majorly. time wasting, but sometimes the things mm-hmm. that we think we're wasting aren't wasting at all. So you're a young mother. So mm-hmm. you've got your little girl and you could put her down on a blanket in, on her tummy and you and she could spend time together there as you exercise her muscles. Now, as Mm -hmm. opposed to writing fantastic blog pieces or doing something that helps a Christian ministry to expand its reach, that may seem like I'm wasting time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, it all depends on who's the judge of whether that's wasted time or not. And that's Mm -hmm. why I think it goes back to, yes, we can say, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will be added unto you. All right. So Mm -hmm. when you're with your little girl, if you are seeking God's kingdom in terms of bonding with her, being someone that she from the earliest of ages knows that she can rely on when the time comes for you to instruct her, when the time comes where she challenges your instruction, when the time comes where she's old enough to make decisions that you don't agree with and you inform her of those decisions, Believe it or not, that time on the blanket has a lot to do with your effectiveness. You take a woman who chose, let's say, a career in the business world, and who got to spend the time on the blanket was the nanny Mm -hmm. or the teenage babysitter. And so what was Mm -hmm. being imparted is the worldview of that nanny or that babysitter. It's, it's not surprising in very wealthy circumstances when the, the governess or the nanny raise the children that by the time the children get older, their allegiance and affinity and love is much more for the nanny than it is for mom or dad. Right. Okay. Right. That said, a woman who is caring for her family and also using the gifts God has given her to further the kingdom in ecclesiastical and or society realms, right, Mm -hmm. has to place a priority. So 
I can tell you from experience, there were times where I was working on important work. I was helping to get Dr. Rush Juni's materials into print, and it was kind of a time crunch thing. I didn't really understand what I was doing, but he asked me, and that was usually enough for me. If he asked me to yeah. help him, it was like, I better find out how to do this. And I look back on that person, and I, I shudder at times at how little she knew. But you know my biggest failure in that? wasn't that it took me a long time or there might be some typos that in the process when my children needed something or I saw they needed something it was like quiet I'm doing important work mm -hmm. you see so I decided mm -hmm. that this work was more important than my family and yet the family's God's basic institution and my primary role before I was going to be helper to a good Christian ministry was to be a wife and was to be a mother Mm -hmm. So you have to say, what are my priorities? Now, the truth of the matter is, if you made dinner at 10 o'clock at night and you have food for the next day, or you made it at 6 o'clock in the morning, if you get the food handled for the family, then you've handled mm -hmm. it, okay? Mm -hmm. So you have to create a schedule that works for you. I don't have a little baby right now. I can actually go to bed at 10 o'clock at night if I want to and then wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning and I can go out and go swim and I can exercise and I can do that because my season of life is not the same as your season of life. Right. So if you're running into issues of time management and you and your husband have a conversation with the things as a couple that you think are important, maybe – now, this may not be everybody's circumstances, but maybe instead of making the house cleaning and the food preparation the highest priority, maybe you could get someone else and, and, and they could clean the house for you while you're doing something that you both consider is worthwhile. If the toilet's clean, I don't know it matters who cleaned it as long as yeah. you're, they're using things that aren't going to make everybody die because they're so toxic. <laughs> okay? But now for some people – that, no, I don't want to go out and do a lot of work in a literary way or, or something else. I, I don't want to continue teaching children music if that was what I was doing beforehand, okay? And I want to concentrate on, on the home. You see, that's a, mm -hmm. that's a decision that I can't make for a couple, and I shouldn't make right. for a couple. Because if you're praying together, you're going to have your responses from God because – you want your prayers not to be hindered. So the most important thing, and I sometimes will tell husbands, your wife is homeschooling. She is preparing the meals. She's seeing that the house is clean. She's handling everybody's laundry. When other people send their children to school, the teacher isn't doing all those things at the same time, and they pay a lot of money for the children to go to the school. So right. how about putting into your budget – that you value that your wife is teacher and that you get some help otherwise, whether it's some girl down the street who needs some extra money and she comes in and vacuums and dusts. Or you have a number of children and they're responsible for meal preparation and doing the laundry or whatever. See, for a mm -hmm. woman, she's supposed to be the household manager. She's not supposed to be the household slave. Right, right. And too many women, good women, I'm not saying these are not good women. When I tell them you need to learn biblical law, when I say you need to understand how to apply biblical law in your personal life as relates to the issues that are going to come up with your husband and his work, as regards to the society in which your children are growing up into, if you don't know that, by the time your children are struggling with their identity, is this my religion or is this my parents' religion, they're going to look at you as irrelevant because you've sort of become irrelevant. So you're mm -hmm. an expert on diapers and you're an expert on baby wipes and, and you know exactly mm -hmm. how to make perfectly good organic baby food, right? That's great. And I, and I think all of those are good things to do. But if you give, mm -hmm. you know, it's like what Jesus said to Martha. You know, it's not like he was saying, hey, nobody needs to do the dishes. You see, Jesus said, don't do the dishes and don't, you know, that's what he said, right? <laughs> no, he said, Mary is picking the better way. She's listening to me and she's learning. The dishes mm -hmm. will take care of themselves. Eventually, you run out and you have to wash them anyway. So mm -hmm. the important part is 
that you make the time. If you don't make the time to learn biblical law, I think it's very hard to say that you're seeking the kingdom first because those are the rules of the kingdom. Other than that, you're making it up as you go along. Right. Yes, and I think that's I think that's absolutely the trap that a lot of us fall into is I think we live by the tyranny of the urgent rather than planning and doing what we're supposed to do. I mean, isn't the Greek word for the manager of the home, it's the despot of the home. It's the person not who is necessarily the one that is responding to all of the things that need to be done, but it's the one who's managing what needs to be done even before it's time to do it. And so there's foresight, there's planning. I mean, all the things that make a good business work, all the things, skills that a good CEO has, that's what a woman needs in order to, to manage her home as well as in that sphere and through that sphere and out of that sphere, you know, go and take dominion and do projects that may not be limited to the home and the four walls that you're in, but do projects that can go out. But first, before you can go out, you have to take care of what's, what is your first priority in your home that because you can't build on what you don't have. You can't send your children out to change the world when you don't first teach them right. what they even what the standard is by which they change the world. Um, you can't be effective in your church if you can't even get to church on time. Right. Um, We're not angry at each role. other when we get there. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that's probably more of the thing. Most people are uh, <laughs> rushing to get there on time, but it's it's a, they've kind of lost the point of the Sabbath by the time they get there. I actually have a and funny all, story about that. This was before, mm-hmm. I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, where I was on my spiritual journey. But so I had one child at the time. We were new Christians, and we were going to go to church on Sunday, and we were going to go as a family. And I told my son, "Eat your Cheerios. We're going to church." He goes, "I don't want to." And I go, "Eat your Cheerios." So I forced him to eat his Cheerios. So here we are at the 8:30 service, sitting in the front row. We're singing, and now he's acting kind of fidgety, and I'm kind of squeezing his arm. In anger. And you cannot sing a hymn praising God with a happy face as you are squeezing your kid's arm. I haven't found a way to do it. And then he proceeded to throw up in the entire row ahead of us. Oh, no. And there, oh, my and goodness. And there was a visiting preacher, and his whole family was the row ahead of this. I'm just grateful there was an empty row in front of us. And if you've ever had Cheerios and milk, the smell that was in somebody's stomach and then came out of somebody's stomach, I think the entire church was wafing with this smell. By the next service, and my husband at this point is pulling him out of the service, and he's going down the center aisle, throwing up as he goes. Oh, my goodness. So tell me exactly what I accomplished by forcing (laughs) him to eat those Cheerios, and we are going to get to church on time? Mm -hmm. Maybe a Mm -hmm. permanent stain on those rugs. I don't know. Okay. (laughs) So my priority there was I'm not sure which audience I was playing to. Mm-hmm. The audience of the usher who was going to say these people are late. I mean, most people mm-hmm. don't pay attention to other people. We think they always are looking at us, but they're not. Mm-hmm. Right? Right. I absolutely agree. And I and while getting to church on time makes sense because it's a good way to to manage time and to be polite to other people and to you know, be there and ready to to participate in the service and listen and everything like that, not be a distraction. But on the other hand, like you said, right there, I mean, it's, it's about priorities. If you're not, you know, whenever it's five minutes to get out the door and your child has lost their shoes again, and I know this because I have little siblings and I know that drill very, very well, and they've lost their, their shoes again, I mean, you can break their spirit in that last five minutes and not really accomplish anything because it's not going to help them find the shoes or you can realize, you know, this is, this is a day to worship the Lord. This is every day is a day to worship the Lord. And maybe you do it without shoes on. Maybe you do it without shoes on. (laughs) Exactly. And your first priority is to teach them God's law, which does not include browbeating them and for losing their shoes when they're four years old. Now, that's not to say that one of the attributes that we know God has is he's providential, right? 
we can mm -hmm. we can imitate that. So let me tell you some of the things I did to remedy the lateness problem. The clocks in our house are 15 minutes early. So right now, <laughs> it looks like it is 10 minutes to the hour when really it's not. But you know what? Even I, even I, when I look at the clock, I'll say, oh, I'm late because, you know, <sighs> and then I get there and even the clock in my car is 15 minutes early. And people <laughs> always comment how they can tell how much I care because I'm on time. Yes. Except I yes. still feel like I'm late. <laughs> Oh. So, and then there is the, okay, everybody's, before you go to bed, have your clothes out that you're going to wear tomorrow. Oh, you mm -hmm. have to iron something? Okay, the ironing board is out. Let me know what you need, and we have it ironed. Is there gas in the car? Did I have to bring something to church? Okay, I already have that made. In other words, if you're prepared and if you plan, then you're in. Now, it doesn't mean that a catastrophe can't happen, but then, so, so my way of time management, if I tell you I'm going to send you something, I am, as I'm talking to you, I pull out the drawer uh, that has the envelopes, I write your name on it, I put, I put a stamp on it, I put it everything else, and now I put it where I know I'm going to see it again to put it out for the mailman. Then I don't have to think <laughs> about doing it. If on the That's other great. hand, <laughs> then I have this yeah. big whiteboard in my kitchen that used to be used for the ever fun algebra problems, but now it, mm. and I have a date and what I need to do. And every time I mm. walk into the kitchen, my, the only thing now I have to remember is to look at the board. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yes. And that's what I actually have a, a little, a little whiteboard. Uh, and cause I, ha I live in a little, a little space. And so I have a little whiteboard right by my door. And that's, that's the whiteboard where if I told somebody I would bring something, if I have to, you know, right now it's got the ingredients. Well, it had the ingredients for everything that I need from the store in order to make food for Sunday mm -hmm. so that, you know, Saturday night I'm not going, oh, what am I making for food? Or even worse, Sunday morning going, oh, no, what am I making right. for lunch right. <laughs> for the potluck? And so, but yeah, that that's, I think something that I've learned is know my own weaknesses and that's my own weaknesses are my worst enemy when it comes to time management. It's so easy to throw off on our family members and to say, well, you know, I didn't do X, Y, Z. You know, we're, we're late because you didn't do this. You know, we're late because you did this and I wasn't expecting this and I wasn't expecting that. Well, we need to plan for the unexpected. And so I know my own, my own weaknesses are forgetting things. And so what I plan for, is, you know, first that margin time, one, one goal that I have is that I've been, I've been steadily making and the, whenever I make this goal, wow, it changes our Sundays completely. So I decided that, you know, Sunday is a day of rest, but I'm not going to sleep in, you know, right until an hour before church. I'm not going to do that anymore. What, what I'm going to do is create a restful environment by getting up at the same time that I get up every other day, which is four o'clock in the morning and get up on Sunday morning and immediately start on that day's potluck lunch. We bring lunch to church every day, you know, get dressed, all the things that I'm doing that last five minute rush. Don't do that anymore and have everything done two hours before it's time to leave for church. Mm -hmm. That last two hours of time is a great rest time. Sometimes something fills up that two hours, but you know, we've even had people, we've even had guests in our home for that last two hours before church starts talking about important things. Um, there, sometimes it just is not, it's not anything, nothing's planned. And so for two hours, I get to read my Bible and study and talk to Kyle about things and, you know, pray and just have that time to prepare for the service. And then if I need an afternoon nap, that's great. That's what Sunday's for. And uh, so that's what I do after the, the sermon. And that's been so helpful. So things, little things like that, something that I've realized it's just in our culture, we tend to live by default and we have to make ourselves grow. And we have to say, you know, I'm going to be an adult. The old childish things are left behind and I don't deserve to sleep in those extra two hours. No, I have a duty. Right. And, and <laughs> just know, so and long as, let me hard. make this clear, because there are people who are listening who are going to say, that's so not me. She's not like right. me. That's fine. You have just described what 
works for you and what works for exactly. you right now. Add five exactly. more children down the road and yep. it's going to look different. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Definitely. You know, right. And as long as you're willing to be in the present and say, OK, what are my priorities? And it's even OK to have priorities shift. Mm-hmm. Right. Maybe as mm -hmm. a child gets older, it's, you know, this is the week that you prepare the potluck and you get everything in the car and you're the one mm -hmm. who loses that extra hour of sleep or whatever it is, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But the whole goal isn't that we look holy. The idea no, is absolutely. that we work six days, we truly rest on the seventh day, and that mm -hmm. in everything, Jesus Christ has the preeminence. Exactly. And if we see Saturday also as a work day, I know Saturday is a great day to, to do family events and to visit people. But something that I've been trying to do is on Saturday morning, prepare for Sunday morning and do what I can on Saturday morning so that on Sunday morning there's less to do. So if there needs to be that sleep time or, or whatever, it's there. So preparing for the Sabbath on Saturday rather than doing it all on Sunday morning is also a really really great way but that's also part of it seeing saturday as a work day that's what the bible says and so you know applying god's law to our time i have found that to be so helpful and not seeing saturday as my day you know well, every day is god's day and saturday is also also a work day right. and, but a work day that can include a lot of fun too sure now let me say this you know in the days of creation the bible says and there was evening and morning the first day. Mm -hmm. So it was a Hebrew practice to reckon the Sabbath from mm -hmm. sunset to sunset. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. And so rather than everybody has to do it the same way, because we're told mm -hmm. in the epistles that we're not to judge each other on days and how we celebrate things. Right. Okay? Exactly. So some people and we're probably glad if we've ever had to go to an emergency room on a Sunday with an accident, that there are doctors <laughs> and nurses working on those days. Absolutely. If you're close right. to running out of gas and somebody has left, uh, you know, chooses to have their gas station open, you're very grateful for it. That just mm -hmm. means that those people have to find their one day of rest, maybe a different day of the week. Certainly any pastor is you, you, it's hard to say he's not working on a Sunday. So it's customary for pastors oftentimes with their families to take Monday. So mm -hmm. it's not like, well, I'm going to judge Shelby because she does it this way and she does it Sunday morning when she wakes up. And I know other people who do it Saturday night before the sun sets and blah, 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 blah. It's mm -hmm. whatever we do. And this is one of my favorite scriptures, whether we eat, whether we drink, whatever we do, we do it to the glory of God. And that brings mm -hmm. us right back to where you started when you said Jesus's every move, every decision was about glorifying God in keeping with the law. Absolutely. Now, we can't do it the same way he could yet. But part of being redeemed in Christ is that we've been given a new nature and we are to obtain the mind of Christ. And the only way to obtain the mind of Christ is is by knowing the law and applying it. Mm -hmm. And when we mess up, which we will, mm -hmm. then the promise of scripture is that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. So even the stumble isn't the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Deciding that I can sin so I can then be forgiven, that's a different ballgame. That's putting God to the test, and that's forbidden. Exactly. Yes, and I was thinking um, while you were talking about that and about judging each other and things like that, I think that we expend a lot of precious time, mental energy, in looking at comparing ourselves to others and comparing others to us. And the Bible talks about not judging in the wrong way, acting as though you're the master of these people and their lives and that they have to give an account to you. Now, everybody gives account to God. And I think that a lot of times, you know, we put God to the test with our pride 
and we say, you know, oh, well, you know, I've got this together, or we notice somebody walking in late to church or whatever, and we, and we think about how we've got it put together, and just if only they could, they could do what we're doing, or if only they understood what we understand, and we have no idea what's going on in their home. We, we don't know what their morning looked like, the things that they're dealing with, and so having that, that judging or even, you know, worrying ourselves to death, trying to, trying to make our homes look like somebody else's home that we admire, rather than realizing that we have to account ourselves. We have to give an account before God how we spend our time, and God knows how we spend our time. And I think that that, that's not taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, and that's also a big waste of time that we could spend meditating on the law of God, reading and thinking about how the law of God applies to our lives. And that meditation time on God's law rather than on other people and what they're what they may or may not be doing, it's, that's precious. And I think that's, that's how we grow and how we begin to find progress in our own lives and find that we have wisdom is if we take that time to pray through God's law and think about what he wants for us to do. And that's, again, prioritizing, prioritizing our thoughts even. We don't need to waste time. It's, it's, not, it's not our jurisdiction. And even Christ gave an example of that with his life. Obviously, as the ruler of the entire creation. He is, everything is his jurisdiction. But as a man, he still was upholding God's order for certain offices and different things. And whenever, like whenever the adulterous woman, there were a few things that was wrong whenever the adulterous woman was brought to Christ. One, where was the man? And the other thing was also that Christ was not, he was not in that office at that time. And so it wasn't in his court to take, to make that they, they were completely doing a kangaroo court right there. There was no, that was not God's order for them to bring this woman without a man, first of all, and to Christ who was a teacher, not one of the judges who was supposed to be dealing with those cases. And they were trying to, to trap him and he didn't waste his time on playing into their trap. He taught instead. He used that time to teach It was very, very effective. And one of the things you're pointing out here, and I'm not even sure you're sure you're pointing this out, but let me think what what I'm seeing you do. If you're spending your time criticizing other people, they're not doing it right, they should be doing this, you are not looking at the opportunities to actually reach other people for the gospel. So once he got Mm -hmm. rid of all those Pharisees by writing whatever he wrote, and I'd love to know Mm -hmm. what he wrote. There's speculation as to what he wrote. But what did he do? He looked at the woman and said sin no more. She was the important person in that whole thing. Yeah, we get to find out how the Pharisees were trying to trap him, but he didn't lose sight of the person he wanted to help. And so think about our culture. In California, where I live, you are hard pressed to go anywhere where people don't have tattoos, sometimes all over their bodies. I believe the scripture says you shouldn't have tattoos, but a lot of people do. So am I not going to talk to them because they have tattoos? Do they not need the gospel now because they have tattoos and the tattoo makes mm-hmm. them hopeless? Or and, and mm-hmm. there's no, no. So it's not like I have to approve of something. I mean, I can see it. I'm not blind. But rather than judge that I know everything about that person because of what I perceive, right? How about if I get to know that person? And how about I find out about that person, and then as that person tells me about his or her life, and I hear their need, I hear what's got them scared, I hear what has them concerned, now I have an open door to talk about the law and to talk about the gospel. But if I'm just so busy finding out everything that's wrong with them, then how am I different than the Pharisee in the story of the Pharisee and the publican. Is, is God lucky that he has me? Is that it? That he, you know, he picked me for his team. How smart was God? No. <laughs> mm-hmm. And on that, on that same note, I even, I recently had a, a, something very similar happen. I had heard some gossip about a friend and I had participated in it. It was terrible. I participated in this gossip. And at the time, I did not see it as gossip. I saw it as a prayer request, right? 
Well, the problem was, the reason that I believe that it was gossip is because all parties involved in this conversation not only had the opportunity, but had the duty because of the nature of the relationships to approach this person that we were talking about and ask them about the problem that we all believed was there, right? So we all had this duty, and yet we were talking to each other rather than keeping it to ourselves and approaching that person. At one point, I was sitting there in my personal devotion time in the morning, and I was sitting there thinking and praying and reading, and and I realized that I gossiped about this person. And I thought, well, how do I handle this? Well, and so I prayed for forgiveness, and, and it was like, no. You know, you don't get to sit here and read this book that you're wanting to read. Get in your car and drive and go talk to that person because you sinned against them. And you still have not brought up that problem that you think is such a problem that you're willing to talk to other people. Mm -hmm. You haven't even brought up that problem to that person. And I want you to do it now. You know, that's what he wanted me to do it now and not to wait. And the baby was asleep. And it was like one of those golden moments where I had time to read and the baby was asleep. And it's like, I have time to read. <laughs> and I spent, had to spend that time in obedience to God to going and, and talking to that person. You know, I sat down and explained and I asked for forgiveness and I explained the gossip that was going on. I asked for forgiveness and I asked them, you know, there's this problem and I really want to exhort you to do differently. And when they responded and explained the story behind what I thought was them making an unwise decision and they explained the story, I went, oh my goodness, we have all completely misjudged. And that was really sad because it was, even though we're all Christian women, it was just a bad testament to us not applying what we know to be true to our situations right there in front of us. You know, we talk about how people don't need to gossip. We teach classes about not gossiping. We teach classes about actually doing what the Bible says and, and bringing problems to people rather than talking to them behind their back. And yet we don't do it ourselves. And I felt very, very rebuked. And it was a, it was a, a blessing to that person for sure. And I, I'm so glad it was. And they forgave me and everything. But just that was that was a use of time that I could not have put on a schedule. Right. I could not have planned for that. But that was, I think, an effective use of time and did so much more to grow my relationship with that person than, you know, sitting down and doing a Bible study or giving to them an article that secretly speaks to what I secretly think they're doing wrong. Right. You know, I was doing what was the very, very hard thing. And I think a lot of times that's why we, we struggle with time management is what is our next priority or our, our greatest priority in that moment? A lot of times are things that we just flat out don't want to do. Right. They're uncomfortable. So let me say two things about that because I would like to comment on what the story you just told me. First and foremost, if you handle things as they come up, if you spill milk and you say, I'll clean it later, you have to clean it later. But if you clean it now, then you won't have other problems like a sticky floor, sticky shoes, sticky carpet. All right. Mm -hmm. So if you get into the habit of dealing with things when they came up, if you can deal with it, right, mm -hmm. then when something comes up, you'll notice that you have time for it because there haven't been all these things you put off. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that to me is a great way of time management. A bill comes mm -hmm. in for me rather than waiting for, well, I have time, so I have to wait till I have enough money to pay the bill. But if I have all my bills together, <laughs> this is what I'm going to do. And now I don't have to think about it again. And then I'll have right. a reminder come up on my email that says it's time to pay this bill. And I go, OK, so I I take a little bit of time to plan so that mm -hmm. I have time for the unexpected. Mm -hmm. You know, so somebody calls up and says, I have great tickets to go to such and such, such and such. And I say, oh, I can't because I have to do this, this and this. Well, maybe if I've made a bunch of meals and they're in the freezer, I don't have to do anything special for the potluck tomorrow because I already have a bunch of meals that I can pull if I need to, mm -hmm. or if I need to bring a meal mm -hmm. to someone, I already have a bunch of meals I can pull from. So that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. it's, Absolutely. it's really not the unexpected in God's eyes. It's the unexpected maybe in your eyes, but it right. really was the important thing. Now, the second point was if you were not a student of biblical law and obeying mm -hmm. God was not a priority to you, you never would have gotten in the car and talked to this woman and found out what really was going on. Mm -hmm. So 
God's word and you reading it and you reading it from the point of view that says every word that proceeds out of God's mouth applies to me and I have to follow it, right? Mm -hmm. That's what allowed you to come to repentance and have a deeper relationship with this woman, right? So, so that's the foundation of it. And so, yeah, honey, you have an imperfect life. Join the club. Who doesn't? But the point is, we shouldn't be keeping making the same mistakes over and over again. And if we can make provision so that we don't fall into the same traps, then that's a good thing. That's what we're supposed mm-hmm. to do. That's, that's what wisdom mm-hmm. means. Yeah, a good man see or what does it say? A righteous man foresees trouble. <laughs> but yeah, he see he foresees the trouble and he passes by it, but a foolish or the simple yeah. pass on and are punished. Right. So if you see a hole in the walkway and you can't fix it right now, and you put cones around it and you put a tarp over it, so somebody says, Whoa, I I need to avoid this, then someone doesn't fall in the ditch. Mm-hmm. And then you fix right. it as soon as you can. But in the meantime, mm-hmm. You're still saying, what outcomes don't I want? Let me make provision not to have those outcomes. Yep. And we need to seize those golden moments that so often we will we will let pass by. The, the baby's quiet or we have, not right now, but the baby in the golden moments, the baby's quiet. We don't have those pressing things. And we're thinking about what needs to happen this weekend or whatever. And so often we'll just let those times slip by. Okay, well, it was good talking to you, and hopefully our discussion will help other people as well. Yes, thank you so much for discussing this with me. I've got a lot of insight from you, and that's a huge blessing. All right, God bless. Thank you for joining Andrea Schwartz and the Kingdom Driven Family Podcast, holding up the family and self-government as a true and lasting means of transforming society. Please visit thekingdomdrivenfamily.com and reconstructionistradio.com.